everyone. The Senate Labor Committee is called to order. First on our agenda today, we have Senate File 207, and Senator Putnam is here joining us this afternoon to present um, the Safe Workplaces for Meat and Poultry Processing Workers Act, which we have heard previously, but um, had been um, tabled for some more work. So as soon as Senator Putnam is ready, we will begin our work. Go back to the Senate Labor Committee, Senator Putnam. Thank you, Madam Chair. I apologize for being slightly disoriented initially. I was distracted by Senator Dornick's uh, uh, enthusiasm. Very good. I understand. Um, um, Senator Putnam, I understand you have an A10 amendment. I do, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, when, uh, would you like to speak to it initially, Madam Chair? Um, perhaps if you want to say a couple of words, um, just to kind of orient us around it, um, that would be good, and then we'll we'll go ahead and move the the amendment. Madam Chair, members, this uh, this bill, uh, if you recall our conversation last time, when last I was here, and I'm sure that there's been little else that you've been thinking of since then, uh, we talked a great deal about ways to improve uh, the the bill that we had before us. But one thing I, I, I do want to make perfectly clear is that in that last session, not only did we talk about a bill, we heard stories of, from people whose lives are dramatically and profoundly impacted by this bill. So as we talk about the changes that we've made so far, as we consider the bill in its current iteration, do not, please do not forget the stories that you heard last time I was here, because that's who we're trying to help. That's the problem we're trying to solve. And I hope that we can all keep focused on that as our goal. Uh, Madam Chair, members, this uh, amendment uh, makes a, a number of changes to the, the bill that you saw last time around. Uh, the first and perhaps most important, I think in a number of ways, is a, a more concrete definition of what a meat packing operation entails. We have removed language, uh, you will recall perhaps from last time we talked about this bill, that our focus is on repetitive stress injuries. So we've taken out some uh, industries that are less inclined toward that kind of, uh, of problem uh, in labor. So for example, we have removed egg processing plants. We've removed pet food plants and rendering plants. All three of those types of plants have been removed because they just don't focus on the same kind of labor that we're trying to help out with. Um, I also want to say that we've identified a meat packing operation or meat processing employee as a business with 50 or more meat processing workers in which slaughtering, butchering, meat canning, meat packing, meat manufacturing, poultry canning, poultry pa packing, poultry manufacturing, or process of meat packing uh, products occurs. That 50-person uh, number uh, is designed uh, in some ways uh, due to feedback from our friends at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Many of you may know that we are in the Ag Committee working very hard to increase opportunities for people to go into butchery and meatpacking and create that industry. Uh, we are uh, doing a tremendous amount of labor on that front to create more opportunities for small startup meatpacking and meat uh, cutting operations. Uh, accordingly, uh, it didn't make a lot of sense to put uh, a one or two person shop under those same kinds of considerations. And one other thing I'd like to add is something that, uh, that, uh, that I did uh, actually yesterday was that uh, we clarify that 50 employees is of meatpacking employees. This no longer would consider administrative or clerical people. It's people who are actually doing the job because again, that's our focus. Um, there are a number of other uh, amendments, uh, uh, dimensions to the amendment, uh, Madam Chair. Those are the, the two that are, I think, the most significant at this point. Uh, we also did, I believe, remove the entire unemployment insurance section because it was inappropriate for the state of Minnesota. Uh, I think those are the big ones, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Putnam. Um, would someone like to move the A10 amendment? Um, Senator, um, do you have a question or, or want to discuss? I don't go ahead. Too, okay. On the Very good. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, uh, thank you, Senator Putman. The um, the question I have before moving it is, did you address the number mm -hmm. as far as uh, 50 is concerned? I have a letter here from. Uh, Rob Lorenz, 
He is an owner of a meatpacking place, and it's quite extensive. But one of the things he does reference in the last couple paragraphs is the Small Business Administration, the USDA Food Safety and Inspection Services. And they recognize small meat processor as a business with under 500 employees uh, rather than 50. And he talks about the onerous, all the, uh, uh, all the agencies that already have oversight, also the fact that, you know, one of the things I think you're trying to address in this bill, correct me if I'm wrong, is the repetitiveness. And we heard testimony on that last time you were here. And uh, uh, that in a smaller meat packing plant, uh, he's willing to go down to 250 employees, which is probably just under what he has. <laughs> but um, they, they don't have that repetitiveness that the larger meat packing plants have. And therefore, he's quite concerned about some of the onerous, uh, what he considers to be uh, regulations and implications of this bill. So was there any consideration to raising that number 50 to something more in line with the USDA Food Safety and Inspection Services and the Small Business Administration before I move the amendment? Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. And I will note, too, that the amendment is a delete all amendment. Yep. So when we are discussing, um, we'll have some discussion oh. about the bill, too, afterward. But go ahead, Senator Putnam, to the to the question about the Madam number. Chair, would you like me to answer that now? If, if you'd like to, otherwise sure. we can Sure, yeah, no wait. problem. Uh, thank you, Senator Grunhagen. So it's a great question. It's one that we've been struggling with a fair amount. In fact, our friends from Lawrence are right there. That's Mrs. Lawrence right there hanging out. And uh, I had a so long- it's her fault? What's that? <laughs> it's her fault? No. <laughs> no, I had a, a long conversation. Uh, the letter that she sent, obviously, as you read it, is eloquent, deliberate, uh, functional, purposeful. Had a great conversation with uh, her and her husband yesterday. And I want to take a moment to celebrate what they do. Uh, they explained to me that uh, at their meatpacking plant, because they're aware of this potential problem for their employees, they cut the left half of the beef on Monday and the right half of the beef on Tuesday and bison on Wednesdays. Did I get that right? Close enough. <laughs> so, but, but Senator Gruhanga, this is an incredibly important point. And it's a challenge that we face whenever we legislate. And that there are folks who are the problem and there are folks who are awesome. Our friend back there is awesome. Our goal is to make sure that we protect the people, as many people as we possibly can, who are in situations that are unsafe, dangerous, or not in their best interest and their health, without causing too much trauma for the good guys. That's a fundamental challenge for everything we do in the legislature. And in this case, with this number of 50 or 500, it's something that we're struggling with, trying to figure out the right number to make sure that we can protect as many people as possible. You heard those stories last time I was here. Every one of those stories, every laborer who is in that kind of situation deserves our respect. But it's our challenge to make sure that we also can protect and respect those employers who are doing the right thing. Uh, Senator Grunhagen. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, and I'll move the amendment, and I do appreciate that response. I hope you will give consideration to increasing that number. I do think that we can always come back and lower it if it continues to be a problem. But from what I, again, I'm not an expert, I'm a layperson on this, but from the testimonies we got, it's large packing plants where you see this repetitive, uh, faster and faster and faster, uh, conveyor belt that these people have to do, which I understand. And I think uh, by going raising it even to 250, I think you would, you would exclude those where the vast majority are doing uh, the right thing with their employees and uh, still address what you, your primary concern is, is this repetitive, uh, uh, faster and faster productivity, with, which creates physical problems, mental, and like some testified, they couldn't even go to the bathroom, <laughs> which, uh, you know, I, I do have a concern about that. And uh, so anyway, that's, but I'll move that amendment, okay? Thank you, Senator. Senator Grunhagen moves that we adopt the A-10 amendment to Senate File 207. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. 
Um, Senator Putnam, is it, um, before we open it up to more discussion, are there any other words that you'd like to say about the bill as amended? Oh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Just that I really appreciate the conversation and discussion and our focus on solving a problem. Uh, and I think that uh, the approach that we've modeled in trying to, to take care of this bill is something that the entire Senate could learn from. Thank you. And we don't have any um, anyone who is testify or is signed up to testify today um, on the bill. But I do know that um, um, the, our commissioner uh, is here from the Department of Labor and Industry. If anyone does have any questions, so with that, um, members, any discussion? Yes, Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I spoke to Senator Putnam about uh, this beforehand. Uh, we were talking about this just a little while ago. I'd like to move the A11 amendment. Thank you. Senator Liskey is offering the A11? Yes. Okay. Um, while we're making sure everybody has a copy, um, do your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, the amendment uh, basically inserts butcher shop and meat market uh, on line 26 after store, um, and it also inserts after consumption, the or for sale in a retail establishment or otherwise directly to end consumer. So oh. basically the purpose of this is oh, uh, okay. local meat markets, especially in small towns like the town I'm from, they do some processing, but it's not with the intent of meat processing, it's with the intent of end sale. So uh, this was a discussion that I brought up last time we talked about this bill. Uh, I think Senator Putnam had agreed that this was kind of not the purpose. We were not targeting small meat markets. This was to target meat processing issues. Um, and so that's why we brought this amendment forward. Thank you, Senator Liskey. Senator Putnam, have you had a chance to look at the amendment? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Senator Liskey, I did, I just did. Uh, and I, am, uh, I consider it friendly. Okay, very good. Um, with that, uh, Member Senator Liskey has offered the A11 amendment, and um, hearing from Senator Putnam, he views the A11 as a friendly amendment. All in favor of adopting the A11, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The A11 amendment is adopted. Members, further discussion, questions? Um, anything further? Uh, yes, Senator Dornick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Putnam. It's been good working with you on this bill. It's, it's come a long ways already, and thank you for um, the amendments you already changed and the continued working with us uh, as a committee. Uh, well done. We're still a few more things, a few questions, but uh, I too want to uh, thank the the person that wrote that's the uh, rents. I, I read that too, Lowell Rents. Uh, I talked to her this morning. Uh, appreciate your letter. Also, I want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Grav too from Hormel. They do a fine job in Austin, and they have um, uh, helped me through this. And, and uh, appreciate the, the help there. And I'm hoping that you can talk to him afterwards and uh, hear about some of the great things they're doing. And um, so. So the question I have, uh, one of the questions is uh, the the coordinator, and just how does that work? Is that going to be uh, a, uh, if there's a complaint, then they go out, or kind of just a little bit more flesh that out, how that position is going to work. Um, and then it does say in here, uh, I'll just give you the page two, section, uh, well, it's actually B, it talks about it, but then uh, 2.8 and 2.9 is talking about full access to all meatpacking operations in the state at any time that the meatpacking products are being processed or meat processing workers are on the job. So um, so just uh, want some clarity on that. Senator Putnam. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Dornick, for that question. I can probably describe that in the abstract, but I think it might be more productive for us to have uh, uh, Commissioner Blissmach perhaps come up and talk about it in more concrete terms, um, if she's willing. Welcome, Commissioner Blissenbach. Did you hear the inquiry? I did. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Nicole Blissenbach. I serve as the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry. Um, and to your question, Senator Dornick, uh, the coordinator um, will be an employee of the Department of Labor and Industry. The Department of Labor and Industry already has the ability to enter and inspect any employer in the state um, for potential violations of labor standards laws, so wage and hour, child labor, 
um, or OSHA violations. So this, um, while this bill does reference the, uh, th that the commissioner can grant, or uh, an employer must grant the commissioner full access to all meatpacking operations, um, that is already how the law works. Uh, the law is under the jurisdiction of the Department of Labor and Industry, and in fact, I believe they are referenced in other portions of the bill specifically. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Senator follow uh, Dornick, follow-up, yeah. Uh, so I guess to be uh, more clear, so as, so is it a complaint? So you get called it a complaint first normally? Is that what you, or they can just stop in? I'm not exactly sure uh, what you meant, but it, it sounds like it's kind of more of a complaint and then, they, and then you go. Commissioner? Um, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Dornick, it can be either. Um, we don't have to have a complaint in order to uh, inspect an on-site at an employer to talk to employees, um, but reality is, is that many of them are triggered by a complaint, uh, especially in the OSHA area where if we have a complaint, um, we do have to respond. Uh, so oftentimes it is complaint-based, but it does not need to be under our current authority in the law. Oh, yes. Thank you for that, uh, Commissioner. So moving to the next question I have, <clears throat> excuse me, is the earn sick and safe and uh, the pandemic uh, part of the bill that's in towards the end. Uh, and I mentioned this a little bit before, Senator Putnam, Putnam to you, and just my concern with this is we have this is kind of, uh, we have a bill that's going through that addresses this, and being this in this bill, it just seems like it doesn't fit because there's many other uh, occupations that, you know, maybe would like this in their bill too, and, and beings that we have a bill, I don't really think this is necessary. Just some of uh, the stakeholders I've talked to, they're concerned about this piece, so I'm wondering if you'd speak to that. Senator Putnam. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Dorn, for that question. Uh, you know, I think the, the most important thing for us to realize when we look at the section of the bill is that first sentence that introduces it, that says, this subdivision applies during a public health emergency that involves airborne transmission. That means that the provisions that follow are only germane in that context. This is not about setting up a, a long-term program uh, here, there, and anywhere. It's in response to the pandemic, to a potential pandemic. Um, and I want to be clear. I know I, I told stories last time I was here about friends that I knew who had to wear adult diapers while they were working because of the speed at which they were required to work. I didn't tell you stories of how many of my friends caught COVID from working at the Jenny O plant, at a plant in Cold Spring, around the Cold Spring area. Um, our uh, transmission rates at that plant were almost as high as they were at the St. Cloud prison because those are similar conditions. So while I would initially be averse to a health program specific to one industry that ignores other industries, the challenges that we face in meatpacking, I think, give some credence to a need for a specific program to deal with public health in that environment. Now, whether this is the ideal form that will take, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, you know, I, I uh, mentioned earlier that I met with a bunch of folks who are uh, technically small size uh, meatpacking plants. Uh, a couple days ago, maybe it was yesterday. And I asked them, tell me directly, what is it about this bill that will cause you the greatest difficulty? And a number of them said that it was the pandemic provision about having to put in new um, uh, air, air transmission kind of stuff uh, and uh, new ventilation in case of a pandemic. Uh, I think that that's a legitimate concern uh, in that situation. But I also think, or at least hope, that there might be other aid if uh, a pandemic were to occur to facilitate that change. So um, I, I would say, I guess, Senator Dornick, that uh, that section of the bill I think is very important, but is still open to negotiation and working. And one of the things that you'll see that's significantly different from this earn sick safe time and the one that's being proposed in the Senate more generally is that in this plan, you can bank your sick days and get paid them out. Um, you can't do that in earn sick, sick and safe time as being proposed more generally. Um, that's, a, that's a variable that I think we need to interrogate a little bit. 
uh, if it's good here, if it's germane, if it's relevant to the specific industry, if there's a justification for doing things differently in this context. I'm not entirely sure that justification exists yet at this point, but it's something that I'm still thinking about and still talking to people about. Senator Jornick, follow up. Yes, Madam Chair, thank you for that. Uh, so I do have a, I think it's a friendly amendment um, that I gave you. I know you didn't get much time to look at it. So it is the A12 amendment. Okay, uh, just make sure everybody gets a copy of the A12 amendment. And um, while we're getting um, a copy and making sure everybody's able to see it um, to the amendment, Senator Dornick. Thank you, Madam Chair. So it's on line, our first page, line 1.21, and it's uh, insert meat processing workers does not include a federal, state, or local government inspector. So it's just clarifying that that's not a meat processing, processing worker. So that is the amendment. Senator Putnam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Dornick. Yeah, that, that seems good to me. I don't see a problem with that. Okay. Um, members, Senator Dornick has offered the A12 amendment and Senator Putnam has indicated that he views that as a friendly amendment. Um, so I move the, the oh, A12 amendment. Very good. Okay. And Senator Dornick has moved that we adopt the A12 amendment. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The A12 amendment is adopted. Senator Dornick. Thank you for that, uh, Senator Putnam. Putnam. And Madam Chair, I'm going to defer to other members right now, so. Senator Grunhagen. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I have the A17 amendment I'd like to offer. Okay, well, while we have that passed out to you, the A17. I did ask to have it posted, but I didn't have a chance to talk to Senator Putnam about it, but I'll explain it. Okay. Basically, it's on line, or page eight, line 14. Thank you. Uh, and it says, uh, you know, it says by workers for, and you insert uh, this statement, as long as medical personnel treating the issue are located at or connected to the meat operation. And then after years, we don't change the five, if provided by an employee from an outside medical provider. The intent of this uh, amendment is that the employer can't be aware in many cases unless the employee lets them know of a medical uh, condition that they have or have suffered. And so I hope you see this as a friendly amendment that it would give a little bit of leeway to the employer if they haven't been notified of a particular uh, health problem as far as the employee is concerned. Senator Putnam. Madam Chair, thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Um, I, I do have some concerns or perhaps some confusion that perhaps you can clarify for me. Okay. Uh, why would such a medical professional have to be employed by the meat pack packing operation? Um, Senator Grunhagen. Isn't there some type of medical personnel on site uh, that the, uh, empl employees can report health problems to or somebody that handles that? Senator Putnam. Madam Chair, I would think that if an employee goes to their own doctor and their own doctor says, look, this is because you have carpal tunnel because you're doing this job, that a note from that doctor would be as valid as one from a doctor who's paid for by the meatpacking operation. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, I think that's what I intend with this amendment. It's maybe not worded as good as it could have been. Um, Madam Chair, if I may. Uh, I'm sorry, yes, sorry. Senator Putnam. Uh, Senator Grunhagen, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Grunhagen, that's, that's the part that I'm confused by or concerned about, is that the medical professional would have to be employed by the meatpacking operation. I think it makes sense that there be some kind of medical record or medical testify, uh, t uh, documentation of injury, um, but I, I don't see any reason to make that restricted to someone who's employed by the company. Okay. Uh, Senator sure. Hagen. Yeah. yeah, I think I'll withdraw then and see if I can get okay. this clarified uh, in a way that is more uh, acceptable to you, okay? Okay, very good. The A17 amendment is withdrawn pending further discussion. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you. I do have an oral amendment, and uh, it's a compromise, and we'll see what Senator Putman thinks about it. On page uh, one of the delete all, line 1.23, I would change the 50, not to 500, but to 250. Uh, 
and appreciate it, uh, that consideration and see what Senator Putnam would think of that. That's the oral amendment. Okay, and that seems quite straightforward. Uh, is everyone on the same page and understanding uh, at line 1.23, Senator Grunhagen has um, made the motion, uh, an oral motion that we um, change the number 50 to 250. Senator Putnam to, Grun, to Senator Grunhagen's oral amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Grunhagen, for this suggestion. Um, I, I can't accept it at this time, but note that I'm still very interested in what that final number is going to be. Um, uh, but again, my goal is to make sure that as many people are as protected as possible. But I appreciate the spirit in which it's offered. Um, uh, from my perspective, uh, as legislators, we have three jobs, and that's to compromise, compromise, and compromise. Uh, that's what we do. Uh, so I appreciate uh, your offering of this number. Um, but also, in all candor, we're still looking for some data from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture about the number and size of these different organizations and the number of employees that are at all of them. So at this point, it would be premature for me to accept that amendment. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you for that response, Senator Putnam. Um, what was I gonna say? The, um, what's the, the path for this bill? Is it going to the floor from here? No, Senator Grunhagen and Senator Putnam, we, in, in my notes, we have this going to judiciary next. Okay. And um, perhaps then finance? I think so. Okay, so it does have okay. a couple more stops. All right, well, that satisfies. I'll withdraw that oral amendment. Okay. okay. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen withdraws the oral amendment pending further discussion. Any further discussion, members? Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one quick question. So from what I understood, judiciary finance, uh, is this going to be reappearing in ag at all, or we're going to just go past that one? I'm assuming you already heard it once in ag, so. Senator Putnam. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we actually haven't heard it in ag yet. All of the uh, statute in here is all labor-oriented. Okay. Um, so we haven't heard it in ag, and I don't intend to hear it in ag. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Members, any further discussion or questions uh, for Senator Putnam? Okay. Um, yes, Senator Senator Dornick. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So, <clears throat> the uh, again, thanks for the receiving the amendments, and uh, I would like to continue to encourage you, and I know you will. Uh, I'm hoping that you can talk to Mr. Grev because there's some other concerns that he has, and I'm not going to. We went through this. We've talked offline, and we'll continue to on some of the things that. Um, are still uh, of concern, uh, but I do uh, just want to say again that the biggest concern I have, and I, we've talked about already, is the the number, and so that is really important when uh, that is because we don't want to to affect those smaller businesses that we're trying to help in agriculture with uh, that funding. So, with that, again, thank you for working together with us, and appreciate uh, the continued talk as we uh, continue to work on the bill in the next few days or weeks ahead. So thank you, Senator Putnam and Madam Chair. Thank you. And Senator Grunhagen, you had something brief? Yeah, just real briefly. I just wanted to say that I thank you uh, also, Senator Putnam, for having the desire to want to do this right and to work with the stakeholders. And, uh, you know, today I'll probably vote no because of the 50, but I uh, appreciate uh, you working on this. And uh, thanks again for your consideration. All right, Senator Putnam, um, any um, last comments or thoughts before we move your bill? Uh, thank you again, Madam Chair, and thank you, members, for the discussion and for your engagement in this issue and for your compassion for the people who are working. Uh, last time, I think, in exchange with Senator Grunhagen, we talked about why businesses don't treat people better in these circumstances. And frankly, as we said before, it's because they consider them disposable. No Minnesotan should be disposable. No worker should be forgotten. And this is an opportunity to come up with a way to remember and respect people who actually work and do labor. So um, I appreciate this conversation. Uh, and I also want to say that uh, uh, I know you're going to miss me because uh, it's my second time here. Uh, but uh, this conversation is not over. And so even though uh, I'm heading to judiciary next and you might not be there, if you do have concerns or considerations, I do hope you will continue to be in dialogue with me as we work to make this as good as we possibly can. Thank you, Senator Putnam. Members, would someone like to move that Senate File 207 as amended be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Judiciary Committee? All right, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, 
Uh, Senator Housechild makes the motion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Aye. Okay, um, the motion passes. Thank you, Senator Putnam. Next on our agenda, we have Senate File 1885. And the Senate Labor Committee's very own Senator Kupek is going to be presenting that bill. Hello, Senator Kupek. Uh, would you, I understand you have an A1 uh, author's amendment. Would you like to move your amendment? I would like to move my amendment, and I can, Madam Chair, I can explain the amendment too if you'd like before we uh, take any action on it, if you'd prefer. Uh, I think we can go ahead and adopt it. It's an author's amendment, and then we can um, discuss it as amended. Sure. I assume that's your intention. Yes. Okay. Um, Senator Kupek moves the adoption of the A1 author's amendment. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The A1 amendment is adopted. Senator Kupek, to your bill as amended. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, first, let's start with the uh, the amendment. That comes out of some of the discussion we had in the Judiciary Committee. So we are taking out uh, the presumption, uh, rebuttal presumption there uh, on page one out of that. Uh, that was a concern for some of the members of the Judiciary Committee, and uh, we agreed that we would work on that before we came to the Labor Committee. And so uh, we've decided that the easiest way is just to take that language right out of the bill. Uh, the second area is on uh, the line, if I go down here, to uh, page two. Uh, line one on page two, uh, there was some concern about um, without prompting, and we are uh, going to stick in a, a little bit of language there for to clarify the without prompting, meaning also to asking, encouraging, or prompting. So that's the the language we are just going to ask to insert there. That also came out of uh, some of the discussion we had in the Judiciary Committee uh, upon this bill. Uh, to the bill itself, uh, Senate 1885 amends, Senate file 1885 amends the Minnesota Human Rights Act by prohibiting employers from inquiring about an applicant's pay history from any source to determine the applicant's compensation. This bill establishes a uh, rebuttal presumption the use of pay history to determine compensation an unfair discriminatory employment practice. The general prohibition does not apply if the applicant's pay history is publicly available unless the employer sought access to those records with the intent of obtaining pay history to determine compensation. Uh, this bill does not prevent applicants from voluntarily disclosing their pay history and does not prohibit employers from acting on that information uh, to support a higher wage or salary than initially offered by the employer. So that way, if you were like, I made a million dollars at my last job, you should pay me more than a million dollars. Uh, that is totally acceptable if that is what you're negotiating strategy. Strategy. Uh, the main reason behind this is that there is a there is a difference in pay, uh, particularly for women and people, uh, and particularly people in minority groups. It should be noted today, March fourteenth is considered the day, uh, the first day that a woman's salary would catch up with a man's salary. So that means if all the first part of the month, the year, months of the year they worked, uh, they wouldn't be equal until they started today. So that's where we're behind. And so if you start out at a deficit and continually apply for jobs and your past salary is used for that, that means that deficit in salary uh, will continue on uh, through your career. And though I know from personal experience, while I am not uh, certainly uh, I'm as a white male, uh, I do not fall into that category, I do know so that for jobs that I have applied for, uh, that my salary has likely been knocked down uh, because of the, they went and shot just a little bit above whatever I was making at that last job, as opposed to possibly what I potentially worth. Maybe not, that's just me. So <laughs> I do have also uh, the Commissioner Lucero here from the Department of Human Rights too, uh, who can also speak to the bill. Very good, thank you, Senator. Welcome um, very much uh, to the Senate Labor Committee. It's really good to have you. Um, if you would just uh, formally introduce yourself for the record and we look forward to your testimony. 
Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, Chair McEwen, committee members. Uh, my name is Rebecca Lucero, and I'm the Commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. I believe my first time before this committee. Thank you for the opportunity to hear this bill and to Senator Kubik for doing the work to carry this agency bill um, forward. Um, so this is the Preventing Pay Discrimination Act, and its goal is to help close Minnesota's gender and racial pay gap, as we've discussed. And it's, it's a simple bill. It says, don't ask an applicant to disclose their pay history. Just don't do it, that's it. And there are three reasons why it's important to be intentional about eliminating the pay history question. First, as we just discussed, women are consistently paid less than men with similar experience, qualification, and seniority. And this pay gap increases for women of color and indigenous women. There are many reasons why this exists, and it's, and this is, um, a, the goal of this is to look at the structural pieces that are in place that are resulting in this. So Professor Hasday, she's the law professor from the University of Minnesota, she testifies about this bill regularly. And if she were here today, she would testify that, uh, she would share that before 1963, it was perfectly legal for employers to pay women less. That it was the norm to see help wanted ads that would list one salary for men and a lower salary for women doing the same work. So there's in t there is systemic discrimination discrimination that is built in that we are trying to break. Because this pay gap, and this is the second reason why we are addressing this, has persisted. So even though the Equal Pay Act passed, the, in Minnesota, um, the pay gap has not narrowed over the past five years. So why is that? If an employer is supposed to pay men and women the same for the same work, why isn't that happening? It is not 1963 anymore, and yet it's still happening. Um, it's still very persistent, and it's even um, most, uh, most problematic for women of color. And that's oftentimes because, I mean, it's for many reasons, but one of the reasons is that employers are frequently asking job applicants about their pay history before deciding what salary to offer. In fact, oftentimes employers often uh, will even ask as part of an initial application um, before an interview has even occurred, meaning employers are even using that information to determine who, who might even receive an interview. So to be intentional about closing the gap, we should look at what policies and practices, formal or informal, are perpetuating that inequality in pay resulting in this discriminatory outcome. So to use, uh, the use of pay history question is one of these practices that on its face is neutral, but the practice causes inequality in pay. So Professor Hasday would again remind us that the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, which oversees Minnesota, holds that it does not violate the Equal Pay Act for an employer to pay women less if the employer determined that pay scale by relying on pay history. This means that without this bill, an employer can pay a woman less than a man for doing the same work so long as the employer can point to the woman's pay history as a basis for that determination, that discrimination, excuse me. Um, so that means that someone can be locked into a cycle of unequal pay that will impact them throughout their lives. So we're trying to break that cycle. The third reason that this is important is it works. Um, you have the one pager. It states that um, it, where they have eliminated the pay history question across the United States, there's been an 8% increase uh, for pay for all women and a 13% 13, 13 increase for pay in, for black women in particular. So when we present on this, the, one of the main questions we get asked is, is this difficult to comply with? And if I could leave you with one message today is that this is a very simple bill to comply with. Um, many employers have already demonstrated this because they've made this change themselves. It's an easy um, change for small employers and big employers. Um, in the exact same way that employers do not, for example, ask if somebody's pregnant, they simply do not ask what your previous pay was. In closing, I do want to highlight all the support that exists for this bill. That includes the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, Mid Men Legal Aid, Girl Scouts of River Valley, Latino Lead, um, and many others who understand that Minnesota thrives when women, including women of color, trans women, women with disabilities, are compensated based on their skills, experience, and education. Our department is ed uh, excited to support this bill um, and do some education and join the over 20 states that have already ended the pay history question um, to end this pay, pay gap across the state. Thank you so much, and I stand for any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Senator Kupek, is there anything that you'd like to add uh, before we start our discussion about the bill? No, not that. 
Okay. Go, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, members, any discussion or questions? Yes, Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I didn't get a lot of time to talk to you, Senator Kupek before the bill was presented, but I do have an A2 amendment, and I, I believe it'll be a friendly amendment. Um, I may even do an oral amendment to try and help with the amendment to make it more friendly. Okay. Um, well, we're, while we're having that passed out, um, to your amendment, Senator Liskey. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, uh, the amendment is to basically help with the words without prompting. Uh, there was an issue with it in the Judiciary Committee. It got kind of pushed through in there. So on line page one, line 23, uh, there's rough definitions when it comes to legal issues with the words without prompting. Uh, so in this case, it would delete that in line 1.23. Um, then also, this current amendment, the way it is formed, would get rid of without and would get rid of prompting. Uh, but as we saw in the A1, it already is kind of working on that. Um, so maybe as a amendment to my amendment, we would delete lines 1.3 and 1.4 on my amendment. Okay, so um, as I understand it, Senator Liskey, and um, that you are proposing um, to orally amend your A2 amendment to delete um, 1.3 and 1.4 of the A2? That's correct. Okay, so remaining then is um, looking to page one, line 23, and deleting and without prompting. Um, but we did have, where did it go? Oh, with the A1 amendment, I believe. Um, oh, I see. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes, Council. No. Um, so I, I'm, I wanted to ask Senator Kupek if I could. Um, so there are two places in the bill that, that uh, says, and without prompting. Your amendment only changed one place, mm -hmm. um, and it inserted asking, encouraging, and without prompting. That's how it would read with your amendment. Um, I think Senator Liskey, I, I'm not yes, certain if you want to correct. if you want, want to remove um, and without prompting, but keep asking or encouraging, but remove prompting. Is I that think, what you're? I think that's what I'm trying to do because the do? without prompting is is kind of a very undefined situation in law. So that was the concern in judiciary. They were worried about that, um, and so even Senator Latz was on board with the amendment previously. So, so Madam Chair and Senator Kubek, I. I think what Senator Liskey is wanting is to delete um, without prompting and without prompting from those two on lines 123 and lines 2.1 to 2.2 and instead inserting and without asking, okay, and without asking or encouraging disclose, discloses pay history. Get, get rid of um, prompting and insert asking or encouraging. Correct. Sorry. That's, okay. Yeah. Right. As I am understanding this, it, this is to provide perhaps th this is concern about um, that the phrase without prompting, it's sort of nebulous. What does that necessarily mean? And so we're going to the... Uh, um, the A1 amendment that was offered at the beginning um, to provide a little bit more clarity to replace that language um, with asking, encouraging. But, but my understanding is the only, and, and perhaps counsel can speak to this. So at page two, line one with the A1, the without the prompting language is still there. It's just that the asking and encouraging are added as language to provide a little bit of clarification, but the word prompting is still there to provide a little extra. Is is it your intention, Senator Liskey, that you would still like to take out the prompting? That's correct. The concern is that the prompting part is, like you said, nebulous, kind of hard to understand and define. So there's not a lot of definition there. Um, and 
that's the concern moving forward. Um, okay. So that's kind of why we're trying to edit that. I understand. Um, one of the things that I'm a little bit concerned about it, at labor is it, if if this was something that the Judiciary Committee looked at, this language in particular, and had some discussion about, I'm a little hesitant to... Um, well, I guess, but we did adopt the A1, so. Uh, yes, Senator Umar Verbaten. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I serve on the Judiciary Committee alongside Senator Pappas, and Excellent. there was discussion about it, but we voted it down. Okay, thank you. Um, Senator, or well, actually, we'll go to- uh, Madam Chair yes. and Senator Kubek, I'm wondering, though, if you would like to also add the asking and asking comma encouraging comma or in the other spot because it it isn't consistent then with you know the two lines in the bill if i would be fine with adding it to, adding it in the other spot to, to to clarify that other prompting too but i okay. think you know I, I also think you know prompting is we sort of know what prompting is and you know kind of fill in the blank so i think it's still important to leave the prompting but i'd be okay with adding that into that other line to to keep it kind of in in sync with what we're doing on the second line. Okay, very good. This is a good discussion, Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, Senator Kupek. Okay, I think we're on board with what we're trying to fix here. So that's like I said, it's not a mean amendment, not trying to be aggressive or anything like that. Trying to fix the wording. And so if we only fix one line, we're not fixing the whole paragraph. So, okay. So am I? Let's withdraw uh, my amendment okay. and let's let Senator Kupek offer his amendment to fix the issue. Very good. That's just what I was going to ask. Sure. Uh, and um, so, Senator Kupek, uh, would you like to offer an oral amendment um, to the suggestion of our counsel, Ms. Fontaine, um, that um, we add the same language that was in the A1, um, asking, comma, encouraging, comma, or, um, to to the other section that refers to without prompting. Yes, I would. I would add it there to 1.23. So without, after the without, insert asking or encouraging. Okay. Or. Okay. <laughs> Same language. Okay. Members, are there any questions about the um, new oral amendment from Senator Kubek? Yes, Senator Pappas. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to be clear. We are keeping prompting and adding, encouraging, and the other word. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. That is my understanding as well. And okay. So um, on that motion from Senator Kupek um, to um, add the language asking, comma, encouraging, comma, or, and uh, to the, let's see, uh, is that it? Yep, uh, paid line one, two, three. Um, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the change is made. All right, very good. Uh, members, any further discussion or questions? Yes, Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks, Senator Kubik, for uh, working that out. I, have you re did you review the letter from the Minnesota Employment Law Council? They had two primary concerns. One might spill over to judiciary a little bit, but it says uh, they thought they could be fixed, and I don't think your amendments fixed them, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, the first one is the presumption of liability. Uh, this bill is at odds with the rest of Minnesota Human Rights Act and federal and state law across the nation. Operationally, as long as the re rebuttal presumption of liability is in place, an employer who does not, does everything right and receives pay history information only as a result of employee's voluntary unsolicited disclosure can still be sued as a presumed wrongdoer. To avoid the liability, the employer would have to prove a negative. And then it goes on. Uh, have you addressed that as far as your bill is concerned? Senator Kupek. 
Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Grudine. Yes. As far as I know, that was when I met with uh, I met with their representatives yesterday in my office, and they said if we took out that rebuttal part at the beginning, that 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 would fix uh, their concern over the bill. So that was part of the uh, A1 amendment, okay. yeah, Senator Grunhagen. I thought maybe it was, but I just uh, I wanted to be clear. Second question that they had, did you address the second concern also about the presumption of wrongdoing, uh, the well-known burden shifting standard under federal and state laws does not impose a burden of proof on employers, much less presume discrimination on the basis of evidence of employers' wrongdoing. That seemed to be their other major concern. Senator Kubek. Yeah, and I believe that's also tied to the, the rebuttal concern. As far as I knew, it's they, they, my understanding after our meeting was uh, if, if we struck that part that we took out in the A1 amendment that um, they would be okay with the bill. Yeah. Okay. Senator Grunhagen, follow-up? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Kubek, for that response. Thanks for addressing that. It seemed like it was a valid concern. And the last thing, NFIB had a, a letter with a number of concerns in terms of the steep civil penalties that were in the bill. Was that addressed in any way, if you read that letter? I I, Senator Kubek? I don't, uh, I don't believe there are any civil penalties in the bill. They claim there's a, uh, punitive damages and up to attorney fees up to $25,000 in their letter, but I have to admit I did not see it in there. Oh, sure. Yes. Uh, perhaps the commissioner um, has can shed some light on this as well. Um, commissioner Lucero. Yeah, Chair McEwen, thank you. Um, Senator Grunhagen, um, great question. So um, violations of the Minnesota Human Rights Act um, may come with civil penalties. Um, and so we want to make this very easy for employers. Um, simply do not ask somebody's um, salary history, and then you're not in violation, and then you wouldn't f face any penalties for that. Any follow-up, Senator Grunhagen? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So my understanding, this would apply to even a small employer with one and two employees. Is that correct? Uh, Senator Kubek or Commissioner Lucero? Thank you, Chair. Um, Senator, um, we don't want there to be um, any discriminatory um, outcome um, for any size employer. Um, okay. This is a goal across the board. It's very easy for one or two for a small employer to follow as well. And yes, it does apply. Thank you, Senator Greenhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I would appreciate, Senator Kubek, if you would address that. I mean, $25,000 for a small, you know, first they have to make sure they know it's out there. Number two, I mean, I started a small business, okay, independent insurance agent, and you're chief cook and bottle washer, okay? And I mean, you're, you're working, uh, I used to work all day and most of the nights, too, to get it started. Now, it's blossomed and done very well. But the point is, uh, I just know the amount of, uh, I, we'll call them irons in the fire, that a small business person trying to get going is doing. And then to have a $25,000 fine placed on them just for an incidental uh, comment seems a little stiff. I don't know if Senator Kubek or the commissioner has a response to that. Uh, if, if there is a response, please feel free to uh, give any response. Chair McEwen, Senator Grunhagen, thank you for your question. So education and outreach is a really important part of what we're trying to do here. We really want to actually prevent discrimination from occurring long before it occurs. And so that is a primary thing that we'll be working with is to do the education and outreach to make sure that people know how easy this is to follow. Uh, we can work with employers to take this out of their application. We can give them some really the, the same exact way that employers don't don't ask specific questions right now. We just need to educate them to make that shift. And that's our goal first and foremost is, hey, let's stop doing this. Let's base it on the market rate. Let's base it at what the actual job costs. No big deal. I'm not out here to catch people here. I'm trying to educate people and then um, and then end the pay disparity that exists between men and women moving forward. And so that is a, those are possible penalties that could come across if there are violations of the Human Rights Act. We're here to educate first and foremost. Thank and, you. And Senator Kubek. Yeah, and Madam Chair, I would just add, I mean, it is a very, it's just don't ask this. It's not, this is sometimes we get into obviously rules that are really complicated and small businesses have a tough time navigating. This one's pretty simple. Very good. Uh, Senator Grunhagen, follow up? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. 
Yeah, I just, you know, NFIB works with 10,000 small businesses. I happen to be a member. <laughs> and uh, a lot of them have fewer than 20 employees. And I just know the amount of stuff that goes through a person's mind, even in the middle of the night when you're trying to start your own business, okay? I mean, it is, for anybody who's done that, it's, it's not easy, and yet it's rewarding when things begin to work out. But sometimes it takes, you know, six, seven, eight years. So I would appreciate if you'd have some type of a graduated schedule in there, especially for small businesses, and that they, they wouldn't be levy first time, right? You know, another thing, and I'll quit with this comment. You know, there are people, not a lot, but a certain percentage, that do game the system. And when they find out what a law is, you know, they can go into a small employer, uh, come out with an allegation that, well, he wanted to know what my uh, uh, previous uh, pay was, and the next thing you know, you're being faced with a $25,000 fine. And, uh, you know, I have had experience with the Human Rights Department when, on, when I was on the school board, and I thought it was a little bit overkill, to tell you the truth, on the incident that happened, which I won't go into. But um, I don't know, I'm troubled by that provision in there, especially for small employers, and I just asked Senator Kubik, being the chief author, to see if there could be some type of flexibility or graduated uh, scale put in there you know, for first time offender, second time offender, or whatever, because, uh, you know, we're in the capital here and it's a little bit of a bubble and uh, reality is outside this circle. <laughs> and I know we ha get I idealistic here, and but ideal idealistic really happens in the real world and we do need a little bit of flexibility and accommodation uh, for people here in the state of Minnesota. That'd be my advice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Greenhagen. And if there is any response, um, please feel free to make any response, but of course you don't have to. Um, okay. Um, members, any further comments before we move the bill? We're after our time, so I'm um, inclined to want to move forward. Um, seeing no further discussion, uh, let me get my notes together here. Okay. Ready. Okay. Um, Senator Kubek, you are a member of this committee. Um, sure. Would you like to move that Senate File um, 1885, as amended, be recommended to pass to the floor? I would like to do that, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. Thank you <laughs> for the motion. And um, I, I very, very um, thankful that you're bringing this bill. Thank you very much for carrying it, Senator Kubek. Um, Members, uh, Senator Kupek has made the motion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. nay. The motion passes. Thank, Thank you. you. The bill is headed to the floor. And with that, um, the Senate Labor Committee is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,